start the proceedings off since we are a small and intimate group. I recognize at least two, two of you, so it's nice to have you here. Um, okay, so I, I probably don't have to say much about Insiders Outsiders. I think most of you will know something of that project, but perhaps since I don't recognize one or two names, I'll just say very briefly that this is a project that I myself initiated to pay tribute and examine in much more comprehensive and sort of detailed way the huge well, the life experiences and also the huge contribution of those who found sanctuary in this country from Nazi Europe to this country's culture. And of course, as part of that, you know, one spreads the net a little wider and looks at people like the subject of Dorothea's talk tonight, who had a more tenuous, but actually very real connection with this country, but who remain far too little known. So it's my very, very great pleasure to welcome Dorothea from Berlin. Um, and I suspect it's the bright sunshine here in London that's actually <laughs> deterring people from logging in tonight. But this event will be recorded, as I'm sure you're aware, on, and we'll go on the Insiders Outsiders YouTube channel. Um, maybe because we are such a small group, we'll keep it really informal, Dorothea, if that's OK with you. And I'm very, very curious to know, I mean, Yona, for example, in, in Jerusalem, I mean, do you, is there a sort of personal or family reason why you have signed up for this talk? I just wonder if anybody here actually has any personal connection with the story of Yusuf uh, Abu. No, no, just just interest. That, that, that's fine. Okay, but certainly one one hope I have of you know sort of having invited Dorothy to give this talk and to stress the the British the London connection is that indeed interesting things might come out of the woodwork as it were in terms of people's. Uh, you know, connections and sort of knowledge of the story. Um, so let me let me start then uh, by welcoming Dorothea very warmly and telling you a little bit about her. She's a Berlin-based art historian and curator, as I think I've already said, currently heading a wonderful place, the Kunsthaus Dahlem, which some of you may know um, as its director and CEO. Uh, she received her master's degree in art history and political science at the University, University of Leipzig, of course, in Germany in 2006. Uh, she was awarded a Fulbright grant to pursue pre... Ah, ah okay, there you are. I knew there'd be something. Can, can you... See, Dorothea, we'll come back to that. Uh, where was I? Uh, yes, yeah, she was awarded a Fulbright um, grant to pursue pre-doctoral research at the University of California, uh, Riverside. From 2006 to 2009 to 10, she worked as a curatorial assistant in, at the LA, wonderful, again, wonderful museum, LA County Museum of Art. Uh, she's been awarded grants by the German uh, Academic Exchange Program, the German Historical Institute in Washington, DC. And uh, most recently in 2021, just last year, she received the Hans and Lea Grundig, and of course they're an interesting pair, aren't they? Um, award for her art historical research and exhibition on artists defamed and persecuted during the National Socialist Fridge. So over to you, Dorothea. I see that there are some other people wanting to get in. I need to let them in. Um, I would suggest that uh, here's Astrid. Astrid is the person, Dorothea, I mentioned who's worked on as a last so I think we can have a nice, you know, sort of yeah. Hello. conversation afterwards. So, so Dorothea, over, over to you. Well, thank you. Hello, everybody. Um, and thank you so much for joining us for me tonight for this lecture. And thank you, Monica, for inviting me. It's an honor to be here. And I'm very happy to um, share some information and story about Yusuf Abu. Uh, an artist really has grown to my heart and, and it has an ongoing project, you know, usually when you do an exhibition after a couple of years, you know, you close the file and then you move onwards in the museum, but this one um, continues to um, keep me busy and makes me very happy to keep finding things and the word goes out to all of you in case you know of additional exhibitions of anything of use of Abu, I'd be more than happy to know it from you gave a talk in New York online a few months ago, weeks ago, and somebody, a 97 year old lady called me up afterwards and shared some amazing information with me. So um, I would like to start by briefly introducing my institution because um, when we mounted an exhibition of Yusuf Abo in 2019, it was not just any building or any institution. The building itself has a long and dark history um, as it was built for Arno Breaker, Hitler's favorite sculptor in the late 1930s and early 1940s and used as a propaganda space. And after being used then for decades after 1945, decades as a studio space for an international studio residency program, 
It was remodeled and reopened in 2015 as an exhibition space for post-war modern, uh, post modernism with a primary focus on sculpture. And for me, post-war art is incomplete if you don't um, try to include forgotten names and artists who unjustly um, are forgotten because they had to um, emigrate or were even murdered by the Nazis. So in this context, we to try and continue to put some effort into making unknown or today unknown artists better known. And um, just briefly, I guess our next project is called After the Show, Art After the Show of Wolfastel in dialogue with Boris Lurie, an artist who emigrated from Germany to um, the United States in 1946 after surviving the concentration camps in Latvia and Germany. So this is us in less than two minutes, which is difficult, but let me talk about Yusuf Abba. But we, before I do that, I also would like to thank certain people without whom I would have never known even the name. My esteemed colleague, uh, Buchu Dugramachu, who's teaching at the LMU Munich, who wrote on Yusuf Abo in the context of other artists. And that was the first time I heard his name. And then since his name in the alphabetical order of an exhibition catalog always comes first, it became apparent how how often he had exhibited in the 1920s and 30s, early 30s, before he was forced into exile, and what an important role he had played in the art scene in Berlin. And then there's the Berlin-based artist side, Balbaki, who's been an amazing collector, both of works and of biographical information, and very knowledgeable person on this. And finally, of course, the family and the estate of Yusuf Abu. You could not imagine a more generous, supporting and helpful family um, when you work on an estate. The fact that Yusuf's work was so little known didn't let me rest and with the support of the Friends of the Museum and a private foundation and some other supporters and a grant by the Robert Rifkind Foundation and support of many, we traveled to the UK, France, Israel and the US to visit archives and relatives of the artists bringing together as much material as possible. And yet I have to say, the archival sources are scarce. So who was Yusuf Abo? Well, we have early photos of him and you can see how exotic he looks and why time witnesses used colorful language to describe his features and figures in the Bohem scene of the 1920s. And I have listed some of the wonderful quotes. Um, Abo is black and temperamental and carries a white heart in his chest and has remained unspoiled in this country, in this city um, of haste and trampling. This is Elza Lascashuda, of who I know one of you is a scholar. In. And then a thorn remover in the world of sculpture well, Abo is one of those artists who are necessary in this groundlessly turbulent time. Only very few still have the strength to stop in life. Oh, our Abo is a dreamy Arab, a soft sculptor like moon in the hands, a little body with an abundance of curls who longs with his life for the Orient. And then again, a poem by Adelas Kashula. He speaks the language of the Bedouin princes who learn their sounds from the desert birds as a child, he rode wild horses with the tribes. Yusuf Abu's heart has remained completely white, but his eyebrows grown together like a prime of a forest eclipsed his Galilean eyes. Well, there are many other wonderful um, quotes to read, but you can see here already, not only um, how many people actually described him, but also how he was somewhat misleadingly characterizes this incredibly exotic figure. Who is this dreamy Arab? Who speaks the language of the Bedouins? Well, with the help of the estate and some other sources we found in various archives, in particular the Office of Restitutional Affairs here in Berlin, where Yusuf Abo's widow filed for recompensation after 1945, we were able to reconstruct the life of Yusuf Abo, and here you see him to the left in his studio in the 1920s in Berlin, and probably around that time also to the right. 
Joseph Abo was born in Sofet in the province of Beirut of the Ottoman Empire in 1888, 89, or 1890. We have different documents stating different dates of birth. Nothing unusual for the region at that time. According to his later wife, Ruth, Abo himself would say that he was born in, I quote, 1888, 89, 1890, or in the year of the best wine harvest, or in the year of the drought, end of quote. Abo left Safed as a child after the death of his father and lived in a nearby settlement of Rosh Pina. And uh, to Joanna, in case I mispronounce this, please forgive me. Um, there was a discovered there in that village, he was discovered by the Alliance Israelite Universelle, an institution from Paris who mediated a school education for him in Jerusalem. After graduating, he began working as a stonemason at the Augusta Victoria Foundation at the Mont of Al Olives, where his talent was soon discovered and the architect Otto Hoffman at the foundation arranged for this young man to have an artistic training in Berlin. On November 1913, um, he began studying at the sculpture of the sculpture at the Royal Academy of Fine Arts. At that time, Berlin was next to Paris, the undisputed center of the avant-garde in Europe, I would say. Or next to Paris, yes. And the young artist did well in this pulsating environment. In 1917, we have the first known participation in a group exhibition the 31st exhibition of the Berlin Secession, so only four years after he arrived in Berlin. Among the more than 170 works by 90 artists, including 14 sculptures, sculptors, two were by Yusuf Abo. It was very much, um, it was much likely there that the famous art dealer, Paul Cassira, became aware of the young talent. And in 1919, he showed his work in two exhibitions, staged simultaneously in his gallery. On the one hand, together with Wilhelm Gerstel, but then again in a presentation of drawings by artists such as Ernst Barlach, Max Backman, Lovis Corinth, Lionel Feininger, Erich Heckel, Vasily Kandinsky, Max Lieberman, and others, those of you who are familiar with the German modernist art know every single one of them as the most prominent representatives of that time. The second exhibition then also traveled to Dresden, exposing Abo to an audience outside of his new hometown for the first time. The same year, his work was also represented in Hamburg. In 1921, Abo had been discovered by yet another famous art dealer and collector, Herbert von Garvens Garvensburg, who was showing his work in Hanover's gallery it is important to notice that the portrait bust Abo made of his new representational gallery and von Galvens is among the very few pieces that the art dealer took to his exile on the Danish island of Bornholm in 1936. In the early 1920s, public collections also became aware of the young talent from Suffolk. In March 1921, the National Gallery acquired three drawings, it is on that occasion that the art critics stated what we read earlier about being one of the very few having the strength to stop in life, the thorn remover from the world of sculpture. And while Abo himself considered the drawings only as studies or notes or fragments, the National Gallery obviously saw much more in it, something that the review at the magazine Cicerone quoted earlier and confirmed when stating, each line has function and breath, displays a sense of being initiated into the essence of a movement, end of quote. In the mid 1920s, a further exhibition provided us, provides us with one of the very few clues about the political milieu in which the sculptor lived during these years. In 1924, and here you can see the photos, Abo participated with two works in the comprehensive first German art exhibition in Moscow, Saratov and Leningrad. This exhibition was organized by the International Workers' Aid, founded in Berlin in 1921 to support the Soviet population stricken by famine. Here again, Abo was shown in impressive company, side by side with Kete Kollwitz, Max Pechstein, Otto Dix, Paul Klee, 
or Oscar Schlemmer. Otto Nagel, organizer of the show, proudly reported, and I quote again, people stood long queues around the museum and rose of four and waited to enter. Throngs of people filled the exhibition rooms. Dozens of guides were constantly busy explaining the exhibited works to the visitor, end of quote. And we see on the photo that he was not exaggerating. Well, the exhibition in Moscow enjoyed great success, Abba once again exhibited in the German capital with the Berlin Secession, with resounding success. His portrait bust of the influential art historian and museum for professional Max Friedlander aroused the interest not only of the press, but also of other museum directors. In 1925, the Städtische Kunstlamm und Chemnitz purchased it from the exhibition of the Berlin Secession and the magazine Cicerone once again was full of praise. I quote, Abo's completely figurative design is clearly evident. Every form extends from within as though from a center of tension and arches with an enormous palpability of the transitions to broad curves, end of quote. And of the bust itself, the article said that it was a zinc cast of extraordinary quality and with an unspeakably vibrant surface. One must recall the many sorry efforts of those who were fascinated by Rodin in order to, to be able to assess the caution, agility and sensitivity at work in this sculpture, end of quote. The sophistication and artistic quality attested here would not, however, protect the work 20 years later. In 1940, the Städtische Kunstsammlung handed over the famous bust for melting it as part of the so-called Metallspende, metal donation under the NS regime. For the time being, however, the work received great recognition in art circles all over the country. And you see here to the left, another version of the work that miraculously survived in Erfurt um, during the, uh, the, the confiscation of the Antarctic Kunst in 1937. Multiple works on papers were confiscated from that very collection for some unknown reason. The metal bust survived, which is amazing for us. But coming back to this very piece, the extent to which the sculptor was appreciated in particular in Chemnitz was also demonstrated by his prominent position in the middle of the 1929 retrospector, retrospective for the Nor Norwegian painter Edward Munch. Here, Abbo's work, Female Nude, was positioned in the middle of the room together with only a handful of other three-dimensional objects from the collection by Rodin and Georg Minner. In the mid-1920s, Abo reached the peak of his career and the Jewish art circles finally became interested in his work. In 1924, the Leipziger Jüdische Zeitung, the, the Jewish newspaper from Leipzig, reported, they quote, the Jewish world does know him, but Yusuf Abo is one of the great Jewish artists who works in silence. He's an artist of our people, an old Hebrew who mastered the Hebrew language, as well as a chisel and drawing pencil, end of quote. And later in the article, and I quote again, a gallery of beautiful women, women's bodies formed from masses of substance, applied with a drawing pencil, the female body, the temple of God, the female body, the world dream embodied in a symphony of limbs and the music of lines. And they all, um, almost all of Abos women, are characterized by a curious gaze slightly closed eyes as in a dream, they do not contain the monumental heaviness of a Balach or the ailing European pain of a Lehmbruck. Abo is a disciple of the European school, but his soul is that of an old Hebrew." End of quote. And here I would like to finally show some, some images of his work so you can get a better idea. Um, most of them being untitled and undated, but we can guess that they're all from the 1920s by the style. Here is um, two words to the right, a rather rough sketch, and then to the left, something that reminds us very much of Colvitt's drawings. Um, you can see, you know, this rather poor woman with a, um, her infant child in her arm. And then to the left of work, and to the right, uh, um, 
quote, or uh, the poem I quoted from early on by Edza Laskashula, which she published in a Berlin newspaper in 1923. And then um, very likely in this catalog of the exhibition of the November Gruppe in 1925, to the right, a work by him, and we can guess or assume that it's actually a portrait bust of Elsa Lasker Schuler. And I would love to hear from the Elsa Lasker Schuler uh, scholar here in the round if that is a vague assumption or if we should could possibly agree on that um, as in the catalog itself, it's not uh, labeled or titled with her name. Um, and then two other works, 1919, a very early relief. So when he was still a student and then mass from the Norwegian sea, um, that is also from the 1920s. Abo is well off these days and has again found another patron. In addition to Herbert von Garvens and Paul Cassira and many other dealers in Berlin, whom I mentioned earlier, some of them at least, he is now also, also supported by Rudolf Probst, a very influential uh, dealer in Dresden who runs the gallery Fidesz. It is through him that Abo meets the avant-garde photographer Xenia Jonas, who portrays him in this uh, two images here, Hugo Erfurt, who you've seen in the very beginning, and then we also know that Umbo took pictures of him, so it's a very impressive group of uh, people. Um, from the late 1920s and 19, early 30s, we hear more and more that Abo is not only very talented, but also very, very eccentric. We have accounts of his various affairs with women, but now also of his sometimes alienating or disturbing business practice. In 1939, his Dresden dealer Probst wrote to a collector friend, and I quote, he could, for example, pick up a work from an owner who had legally purchased it for some reason of excitation or because it needed a better plinth or whatever, and then never returned it. Since it belonged to him and he could have never given it away, it was a work that was fundamentally in, insalable for him. This generally led to outrage and indignation. In reality, it is a highly strange delusional relationship between the artist and what he has created. In the meantime, however, I have understood the mental preconditions of these fixed ideas and actions, and I learned to no longer take them personally. In no way does it cloud my always amicable perception of Yusuf Abo and my high esteem for his autistic talent." End of quote. There are countless more episodes that confirm the great reputation Abo had and the admiration he enjoyed for his oeuvre. But I would like to turn now to the rather sad two last decades of his life, where the artist was continuously represented by the most important galleries in the country, and increasingly shown abroad his financial situation began to deteriorate. And as a stock market crash and the world economic crisis affected also the art market. Although museums acquired works here and there, these sales did not generate further and sufficient income. And it's not only the dire financial situation that was getting worse. Political circumstances are almost becoming increasingly adverse. And in May 1931, Ludwig Justi, the then director of the gallery, National Gallery in Berlin turned to private Jewish patrons to purchase works by the artist since it was impossible for him to acquire works by non-native Prussians. So he wrote, for many years, the Kronprinzenpalais or the National Gallery had ex exhibited a much noticed work unknown in its showrooms. I would have for many years wished to purchase this work, the National Gallery, would be grateful if he could offer us the opportunity, for example, in the form of a donation to acquire Mr. Abo's work. But despite Yusuf's, uh, Yusti's intensive efforts, he failed with his request. And things were only beginning to worsen. Though there was a positive intermezzo in the 1930s, when in 1933, he met Ruth Schultz. She was also an artist and had studied at the School for Arts and Crafts in Berlin. Shortly after they met, however, the young woman was exposed to anonymous threats about her connection with a non-Aryan foreigner. At around the same time, it turned out that Abo had become stateless. 
with the collapse of the Ottoman Empire, his passport which, with which he had first entered Germany had become invalid. And when the National Socialists seized power, this circumstance, as well as his Jewish origins, became sources of serious dilemma for Abo and his then girlfriend, Ruth. Together, they looked for ways to leave the country. In August 1934, Ruth left Berlin by herself, awaiting departure possibilities in the north of Germany. As yet unmarried, they were now expecting their first child. In October that year, the couple tried to cross the border to Holland. There, however, Abba was denied entry. They spent a short period of time in Bentheim, a small town nearby. In the Bentheim, the decision was made that Ruth would continue to Holland, waiting there for Yusuf to follow. But the plan failed and Yusuf had to return to Berlin, where Ruth gave birth to their first child, not knowing anybody in Amsterdam, nor being able to speak Dutch. In the absence of her father, Jerome Abo was born on November 8th, 1934. Since Yusuf was unable to leave Berlin, Ruth returned in December that year. From there, the couple moved to the artist colony of Wolfswede. Abo frequently returned to Berlin, desperately trying to find a solution there. In March 1935, he traveled without Ruth to the Eichholz Castle near Wessling in North Rhine-Westphalia. For, its, for a short stay with his friends, the family von Just. It was there that a portrait of the family girl was um, made, this one here, identified in the process of the making of our book and exhibition only by looking at the backside of the drawing that we found the letterhead of the family von Just. Well, it is um, the stay with the family that was most likely an attempt to make money from sales of portraits so he could afford the escape from Germany. We know from other sources how Yusuf tried to sell works to committed collectors everywhere around Germany, but help eventually came from a very surprising source. It was the Egyptian consul in Berlin who as many of artistic sensibility appreciated the artist's work and who was aware of the predicament and finally made the desired departure possible by issuing a false passport you can see here in May 1935. Abo's place of birth was now Mansura and the date February 14th, 1890. The document was valid only for one year, but it allowed Abo and his girlfriend and later wife Ruth entry to England, France, Sweden, Norway, Switzerland, Belgium, Australia, um, Italy, and the Netherlands. So in September 1935, the British consul in northern German city of Bremen issued the visa for England. So the couple was finally able to leave and arrive in England on, the, on September 26th. They moved to a small flat in London and got married in November, shortly before their second son was born. Despite the adverse living conditions, the young couple had hoped that the situation would soon improve after all, Yusuf had brought letters of recommendation from important collectors in Germany and British institutions such as Leicester Galleries were interested in organizing exhibitions. As early as October 1935, the, the director of the Victoria and Albert Museum in London wrote to the sculptor, and you can see it here to the left, we were very interested to see examples of your work, which you were kind enough to bring around yesterday and hope very much if you're able to arrange for an exhibition in London. The hopeful beginning, however, does not develop as successfully as in Germany. The reasons for this is ultimately the lack of representative works from the Berlin years, because in the summer of 1934, Abbas works and working materials had already been sent to Hamburg to be shipped from there. However, for reasons that can no longer be reconstructed, they did not arrive in London until in the uh, late 1937 and all heavily destroyed. So there is not only a lack of funds, but also of works. And in addition, Yusuf has no longer a network of supporting art dealers or buyers. Von Galvens had emigrated to Denmark. Flechtheim, his other important dealer, had migrated to London, but had financial problems himself and was no longer act as, active as an independent gallerist himself. I worked for Fred Hoyland Mayer. 
Yet, Abba was left alone. He put quite some effort into getting and staying in touch with other exiled Germans. He also had links with the Free German League of Culture, a network of exiled artists, writers, etc., who exhibited his work. This in return led to an exchange of letters with the famous artist Kurt Schwitters, who himself was in exile first in Norway and then since 1940 in London. When Abo exhibited at Ben Uri Gallery in 1944, his torso be didn't come from his studio, but from a collection of A. Panofsky, most likely the banker Alfred Max Panofsky, who had emigrated to London also in 1938. These old networks, however, were not sufficient to establish a new career, let alone provide for his family. And we can see that from the small scale of the works and the you know, simple material he used to create works in London the, during that time. So we have two samples of his work from the London years. And then, um, well, actually I should go back, sorry. <laughs> In their distress, the Abos sold some works they originally intended not for sale to the director of the Tate Gallery, James Mason, but these means were hardly sufficient to live on. The family got by hardly and moved to the countryside where Abo was, in, was to instruct their hosts in sculpting. These courses Abo taught did most likely take place because of the efforts of the author Thomas Sturge Moore and the sculptor Ethel Pye, and now we see it. Because this is one portrait bust that has survived in the estate. And my colleague, Bocio Dogramachi, in our catalog has um, phrased the idea that this is actually a portrait of uh, Thomas Moore because we know that he commissioned the work. And I've put to the right two um, drawings of him and maybe, you know, even the, the beard is a little shorter, which may just be due to the version of the cast. I think it is a good theory that it's actually a portrait of him. Pye described the emigre in a letter to a friend, and I quote, he has a refreshing personality, if one does not have too much of it. Even his touching faith in the supreme importance of everything that has ever happened to him has a truly childlike intensity, end of quote. We do not know how successful Moore and Pye were, Yet we do know that in 1938, he was invited to Osselet Park on invitation of Lord Jersey to exhibit his works there. Or really the year before, 1937, an invitation of Lord Jersey, oh, sorry, a group of enthusiastic supporters, the Peace Pledge Union, tried to, uh, who supported or tried to support emigrated artists, wrote to the director of the Tate Gallery to do some fundraising for a commissioned portrait bust of the politician George Lensbury. We see that here. We think that the fee which we should offer Mr. Abo should be at least 150 guineas. We are sure that it will be easy to find friends and admirers of George Lensbury in the peace movement who would like to subscribe one guinea each in thankfulness for the clear and courageous lead he has given us during the eventful last two years." End of quote. This commission work was indeed realized and even cast in Paris, where Abo spent the spring of 1939 and was able to participate in the 16th of the Salon des Tuileries with his hat of a young black man. We see it here to the left. Paris remained a short escape from the worries in England. The finalist work, which we saw here already, was then presented in London in 1939 and the Times wrote, the bust which is about one third over life-sized and in bronze is likely to give permanent satisfaction. It is unmistakably the head of a thinker with wisdom rather than cleverness as the distinguishing character. Mr. Abo, who is Egyptian by birth, has a comparatively rare capacity to combine compact modeling of the general form with full subtlety of expression. He avoids alike the extremes of naturalistic imitation and of empty abstraction. His work is really a translation of the subject into terms of enduring brand." End of quote. Despite positive reviews of this Lansbury bust like this, Yusuf Abba was unable to continue what had once begun so promising in Berlin. 
The art historian Bocci de Gomaci in her contribution to our exhibition catalog wondered whether Abo's lack of success and sufficient income may have ultimately been due not only to the fact that he lost his network of art dealers and collected, but also because the appreciation in Great Britain for figurative sculpture was far less than in Germany at that time. But this is obviously another full topic for a lecture. In any case, we do know that Abo was struggling financially. As Ethel Pye noted in a letter to her sister, and I quote again, the problem of the family Abo is severe, as though he may get a few things on show, but no one is buying. I write to people, but who has the time and thought for a portrait? End of quote. At the end, Yusuf Abo was forced to work as an unskilled worker for a drainage, drainage project until he gets severely injured. In 1945, he was forced to give up his last studio financial reasons. Due to the lack of means to relocate and store his art, he destroyed numerous works. Yusuf Abo died in London on August 29th, 1953. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Dorothea. It's totally fascinating. Um, I just want to have best to do this because it's a small group. Um, obviously, if people don't want to be visible and keep the cameras off, but may I suggest that you stop screen sharing and we go. Yes. Uh, actually, how do I do this? Hold on. Um, there we go. That's it. And view, if I go gallery view that's right and then we can hopefully see each other and have a more uh, intimate com conversation good okay um fine yes absolutely no no most 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 interesting um Astrid I don't want to put you in a spot but do you want to sort of start the ball rolling by giving your thoughts about the Alaska as Alaska Shula sort of uh, relationship um, yeah, let me start by thanking you, uh, Dorothea. It was such an interesting um, uh, presentation. I have to admit, I came across Abo very, very recently. Um, so, and I did then come across your work and Dugramachi's work as well. Mm. Um, yeah, I don't know. Uh, it did look convincing, actually, um, that this could have been. Um, I, I think there is there are some drawings, or at least one I'm aware of, but I think there are some drawings by him of Lasker Shula, right? Yeah. The, um, prom yeah. the promise that they're, they've been attributed as portraits, but he never, you know, put the title underneath on the backside or anything. So um, we know that they were very close in from 1921 onwards, then there's the published poem of 1923. And then they have this huge fight um, in, in the late 1920s and then they never talked to each other again. Because she, she lived in his studio for a while yes. and something yeah. well, happened there, right? Yes, um, he apparently there's, there's this um, story that he, um, set up a, like a Bedouin tent in his studio and it was really this yeah very classy bohem avant-garde thing and as Alaska Shula's son Paul got very very sick and until his uh, death she took care of him in his studio so he was um so she rented it from Yusuf and then she was late paying the rent apparently and they went to court and huge fight. <laughs> she was in she was super disappointed that he would fight with her and have a legal fight where she was grieve in a grief over the death of her son yeah. naturally and understandably so so they had this huge fight um and it's a it's a sad thing because we know that there were letters between the two of them existing in the possession of an art dealer who recently died here in berlin but um it i'm i was unable to contact the estate and and he the art dealer always claimed that he never had these letters but we do know that he used to have that so there must be additional sources of there the two of them so these letters have not found their way into the critic uh critical kritische ausgabe no. of the Lasker schuler works no, right. interesting can I ask a question as well? Sure, <laughs> Unrelated. Um, obviously, Lasker Schuler uh, was so much into this orientalization and exoticization, which comes across in the in the poem, and lots of people exoticized him clearly. But was he himself 
playing with this because Laska Schula was also staging herself in this yeah. exoticized way. Did, did he sure. play with that as well? Um, I would himself? say so, yes. With this, you know, the, he was obviously, I mean, he was a womanizer. We know that very much. Um, the people he was surrounded by were very much avant-garde circles. But when you look at the portraits, he, he, you know, he plays a certain role. He was, um, I mean, he was, he was not dressed like a Bedouin, not that, but we, we know the story of him, you know, him, uh, putting up the Bedouin tent. We know oh, yes. of the fact that he, um, you know, the way he appeared in certain circles, we know that he, he did use that a little bit. And it's funny because, um, I mean, he, I, I would doubt that he rode the horses through the desert as a young child. And yet, <laughs> For you know, sure not. the story must have come from somewhere. I don't know. But <laughs> yeah, so, um, so there's, yeah, that's there's, her fantasy. <laughs> Yeah. But on the back of that, I mean, I also, and it's very obvious that I was also struck by the way that, yes, he's constantly exoticized, orientalized, whatever word you might. Very to, much. Uh, to which, isn't, the, which isn't uh, unusual. Yeah, it's, yeah, it's not unusual. I mean, if you look at the, the, the studio spaces of the Brücke artists at that time, and he was in touch with them as well, it's a, it's a fairly common thing about, um, you know, artists who, um, avant-garde artists at that time who were also interest in non-European, non-Western art. So, you know, the, the whole um, expressionist groups, they were all very much um, into that and like to, you know, change the appearance of their studios according to It's that. more than that though, I think, isn't it? I mean, the fact that he's born in the former Ottoman Empire, Palestine, was it sort of black, white heart, Arab, and then old Hebrew, again, kind of flipping the coin to the Jewish side, but yeah. again, you know, making him other and Egyptian by birth. Of course, he wasn't Egyptian by birth, but that's yeah. and that it, so it carries through to this country as well, the way that he's perceived as I, I guess I guess what he yeah. did, and I think that's that um I I I would be I'm I'm very hesitant to say that he used this Egyptian thing in, in the UK. I think because he got a fake passport, um, mm. I think he was very careful not to mess with this status you know because that was the only way that would guarantee him to be able to stay in the uk if anybody would have found out that he was actually born in safet he I would forgot have that. Lost no, makes that you know his visa status so um coming from egypt would allow him through the commonwealth status um to to you know stay in the uk so i i think there may be other parts playing into that but what's interesting there's um i i know of of um and one other um, Jewish sculptor, a sculptor who came from Palestine, now Israel, almost the same year, studied at the same academy, but remained very figurative in the way he worked and never, never, you know, um, like pretended to be Oriental or Bedouin or anything like that. That's Joseph Hebroni, um, who was, you know, on a scholarship just like him, almost the same time, and they met in 1939 in Paris. How do you so, spell his surname? I don't think I've come across him. Joseph Hebroni. Hebroni, um, yeah. yeah, Hebroni. Very, very, fairly unknown artist, mm -hmm. but pretty much the same, almost the same biography, you know, came from Jerusalem to Berlin to study on a scholarship in the 1910s and 20s. And then because he was Jewish, fled to Paris, couldn't return to Jerusalem. So very much alike, but yet, um, Yusuf Abo, you know, pretended to be this exotic Orientalist Bedouin boyish figure, and really, I mean, has heavily like drinking a lot, partying a lot, celebrating life a lot, and we don't know the same uh, from Joseph Ebroni. I'm wondering, Yona, I'm curious to know. I mean, is is Abo known in Israel today at all? Had you had were you familiar with him prior to listening to this talk? Well, I've heard the name, but I'm not sure how. Um, I'm very curious to know more. Yeah. Been very um, Rose, I think it might be you. You're not muted. Um, and that, Rose, I wonder if we could bring you into the conversation if you'd like to be yes. brought in, because you said, in fact, I, I, you were the, your message was addressed just to me. Rose is a friend of 
presumably Jerome, yes? The uh, yes, you said yes. Jerome, in fact, who must be quite elderly by now. But Rose, would you like to would you like to uh, say something at all? Don't feel obliged. Well, well obviously, you know, sort of in comparison to what Dorothea knows from from the family, I, I know very little. But I think having known them for for forty plus years, um, the artwork was often there and displayed, and the stories of the Bedouin tent, all these sort of myths. Um, would surface, you know, around the table, you know. Um, and I think I've got an interest in, in, in art because I was part of a, 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 a circle in, in, in London at the, at the time. That's how I met the, the family. Um, it, for me, it was a window on a refugees, Jewish refugees, and, you know, the sort of what actually it, it had happened. I think, you know, in my 20s, um, it was something from my particular background, which was outside of that experience, um, was not something really addressed. And it was only when my world came into an art world and an art world that you know, had um, people from families like, like yourselves and all the people that you know, you've, you've had through the, through the program, that I became aware of the, the plight and, and as you've sh shown, you know, as Dorothy has shown so clearly, that the, the absolute sadness um, and tragedy um, of someone sort of creative who, who, whose life was just sort of e finished forever, e e you know. And I think for me as a sort of young person, e you know, growing up in Britain in, in, the, in the sort of 60s, that was sort of, e it was quite a revelation really, I think, e e you know, so uh, um, as I say, e you know, this this program that you've sort of initiated inside or outside has been for me you know sort of complete revelation um to the enormous amount of the uh, creativity and talent that has gone i think you know sort of um largely acknowledged in in the wider sort of landscape you know um Certainly I come from an academic background, but it's not something that until recently, until all the efforts being put in by yourselves, has really, um, you know, found a place in, in, in sort of anything other than a niche area. Mm. No, it's really, I'm, I'm <laughs> delighted to, to hear what you say, but I mean, you know, we, yes, I mean, certainly in the art world or the sort of cultural world, you know, yes, Schwitters, and then perhaps people, people like Lucien Freud, Frank Auerbach, um, Kokoschka, I mean, you know, yes, these are big names, but what is not known is precisely this huge array of talent, much of it thwarted in its tracks because of external circumstances, and obviously Abo is very much a case in point there, and I'm thinking also we had a wonderful talk, Dorothea, and I can send you the um, recording of it, of, um, and, um, about Ernst Neuschul, and again, when you look at the story of his pre-British life, mm. the names that he consorted with, I mean, these are the great and the good of avant-garde visual culture, um, or Georg Mar Meyer Martin, who's actually Hungarian, but working in Vienna, um, and they come here and they subside into a kind of relative obscurity, and it's terribly important, I think we all mm. will agree that they should be brought back, you know, in, in, into the picture, as it were. Tell me something, Rose, uh, sorry, or Dorothy, I mean... I, I, I think it's, it's interesting to see, I mean, he did have, you know, exhibitions in the UK, mm, which yeah. is, which is compared to others, quite remarkable, you know, he, he gets these commissions and he has people like Moore and Pai who really try to support him, which is amazing. But then um, I think what, what's even more important is that after 45, when the war is over, that's when the really bad circumstances are because he is a foreigner in Germany, he was a foreigner in Germany, he is a foreigner in the UK, you know, double foreigner, so to say. And then after 45, he no longer has a network of dealers, of collectors, of museum people who are, you know, those who are still alive and know him and are influential in Germany are focusing on re-establishing German art and not, you know, including foreigners. They have their focus so set on on, um, on you know, German arts or native German, so to say, or whatever, I don't know what the politically correct term would be. But um, I think it's, it's, it's a, you know, his background, and it's not necessarily his Jewish background, it's his nationality or his oh. non-existing nationality, mm -hmm. um, possibly together with his Jewishness plays a role into why he's not re-entering 
the the post-war German canon. You know, it's 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 a it's a double thing that we have mm -hmm. to. I suppose what interests me is why he hasn't entered the British canon, or at least is not better known. Because I'm thinking, you know, there are also sculptors of some, you know, accomplishment. And for example, Franta Belsky, who was from uh, Czechoslovakia, or Oskar Neumann of Yugoslav Jewish origin. But, you know, it surprises me that they actually managed clearly to establish networks of patrons and supporters and actually ended up doing portrait busts, for example, of, again, some of the great and good of British 1930s onwards culture. So, you know, it was possible to do so. So I wonder, I wonder what went wrong. I mean, we'll never know, we never can be sure, but I, was it partly the personality of the man? I, I, I'm, I'm always very hesitant to, yeah. to say anything about personality of mm. somebody I've never known. I mean, no, sure. it's so entertaining to read the stories of, of him being a womanizer in his tent and him drinking and him partying and all that. And then um, I know from the family that he must have been very frustrated and angry towards the end of his life and then injured and working in really terrible conditions. And that does something to a man. Um, but I never met him and I, I really, uh, from a scholarly perspective, I really don't want to yeah, even comment on his personality. After it gone. But I thought the argument you made that part of it, that he didn't have work to show mm. and that it only arrived a few years later and then damaged was not does go some way of explaining why he wasn't able to. Yeah have shows maybe but again yeah. that's true of quite a lot of the other emigre artists sculptors that i've come across it's clearly not just that I and mean, obviously it's a whole constellation of issues i'm also intrigued you know there's sturge more and i have a feeling but i may be completely wrong here that sturge more also gave support to an artist who ended up in cornwall in the west of england called albert royce who was actually of, of austrian or no have i got that right i think so i'll have to double check on that was he a quaker was sturge more a quaker <laughs> I have a feeling he might be. Again, I'm going to check on that. But if he was, that's interesting because you may or may not know the Quakers actually collectively did a huge amount to help refugees. I also yeah. noticed Aldous Huxley, for example, in the list of patrons that you on one of the images you showed, and Julian Huxley also appears. You know, these are these are influential men. Yeah. yeah. But if you think of the Meidners, I mean, Ludwig Meidner was such a famous person, mm -hmm. and here in England, you know, he went back to Germany, didn't he? Because yeah. He, but his work is much more extreme in its expressionism, isn't it? Whereas, in a way, well, and, and he is... and he also, I mean, he really, um, you know, those who return had a better way of of reconnecting. And Yusuf never had the means to to go back to Berlin, not even once. And and, and... he was also an outsider before, right? So yeah, it wasn't exactly. like somewhere to go, a home to go back. To. Yeah, yeah, and there was there was some efforts in the 1950s to you know raise awareness, but then he he died already, you know. Mm -hmm. So it was it was really and very unfortunate, you know, things of, of uh, events linking. And tell me, what's the, the the Brighton connection? Did he himself move to Brighton, or is it the yeah. next generation that? It was Jerome, up? right? Jerome and moved to Brighton. Yeah. And what about the second son? Is he still with us? No. 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 And oh, Rose, there, Jerome... were three, there were three kids, and kids. Um, and uh, Jerome was the very last one. To, um, and I actually met Jerome shortly before he died. So um, I managed to visit him and talk to him. Um, and then I did visit the the family of Hussein, the second born. Um, in they live in California. Um, so his widow is still there, and uh, some of the uh, grandchildren are living in the states. Um, and I don't know exactly where the third, the third party lives, but they're all cool. over. I mean, the family in general—they're in Switzerland, they're in France, they're in the UK, they're in the US, um, and some relatives through his Yusuf's sisters are, of course, still in Israel. And I know that there was a connection, and there's a letter. But unfortunately, I don't have the address um, with the cousins talking to each other um, about why Yusuf came to uh, to the to the to Germany. And Bruce, maybe you can answer the question. I'm curious: Is there a younger generation who's sort of oh, yes. to promote? You know, uh, absolutely. I'm sure. I'm sure Dorothea has met the grandson who is based in in France. Yeah. Um, yeah. Who you know, and uh, they they. 
they sort of, it, it, it's strange when I look at uh, Yosef, obviously, you know, I see, I see Jerome, who I knew very well, I see the other brothers, but I can also see it now in, in the great grandsons who, who one of them is a, a, a young musician. And, yeah. uh, you know, to sort of, so that there's a, an artistic sort of, you know. but sadly, you know, and I think it was very interesting what you were saying about perhaps being an, a, an outsider to, to Germany and then an outsider to Britain, that perhaps he, he, he with, the, with the business of the Egyptian passport, he didn't feel that he had a voice. But it, again, it's something that I've, I've, I've noticed amongst friends who, you know, who have traveled this route from, from Austria or Germany, that, that that time of their sort of uh, parents, grandparents, great grandparents, it's, it's not talked about. Um, so I wonder how much the great grandchildren actually ever, ever sort of talk uh, about their great grandfather or really know. Um, I mean, I think three years ago, I was sitting with some people at a dinner table who I've known for maybe 30, 40 years. I had no idea that their family had come from Germany. It, it, it seems that there was still a climate um, that it just was better not to say anything um, and not talk about your family and where they came from. And I, I think that again, it, you know, it's all credit to what, what's going on with the insider outsider project is that people should be proud you know but it seems that it's still there and that's amongst friends you know and people who are you know kind of how can i say it so not anything but you know supportive yeah. you know. And Rose, we were actually, Dorothy and I were talking just before we sort of started properly about, you know, this sort of now this new hot phenomenon in the sense of the next generation or even the third generation being so keen and you know, determined to find out more after the death very often of the older yep. generation and often to engage very creatively about um, that. So I think you know, it's, 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 a, it's a fluid process, isn't it? But uh, interesting what you say. So what's actually in Brighton? When you talk about the archive in Brighton, Dorothy, what's actually there and who's in charge of it? The family. That's the, the like part of the family lives there, and they have they have a number of works there. Yeah. And have they ever tried to organise an exhibition in in the south of England, or indeed in in London? I think they have tried, and there have been you know, participation in, in the exhibitions, but no like monographic show. Mm. Uh, I know. Of. And did you when you did your show in Berlin? Did you try and? make it travel anywhere not not to the uk we, we had a travel within germany um but then um actually it was um it was the year we had the first covid lockdown yeah so that that was the unfortunate coincidence also that really stopped us from continuing the work and moving sculpture is expensive at the, the best of times, transporting yes. isn't it? But uh, yes. what a shame. I mean, I'd love to, you know, I've got various contacts. We should probably draw to a close in a minute, but you know, in the South of England, I mean, for example, Pallant House Rose that you probably know in Chichester. Mm. Yes. It's a wonderful gallery. And I'm actually now with uh, Simon Martin, the director. I wonder if it's worth having a word in his ear. I mean, is there is there enough work, would you say, in this country? Plenty. There's, yes? plenty, yes. there's plenty of work in mm. the UK. Mm. Mm. to to mm. mount a good exhibition they don't have large scale works most of them are like you know in yeah. arm's yeah. length um but they you know they the i would say the key works are still in the possession of the family and they're gorgeous okay, that's good to yeah. know. absolutely stunning okay well let's see what uh, what we can do what uh, can happen uh did you, you probably don't know the gallery in Chichester. it's a beautiful gallery and actually they you know their their remit is to show the best of not always well-known but you know early 20th century British artists and, and later as well so they might well be interested anyway yeah. okay. I mean that well, would be that would be amazing yeah, yeah. that would be absolutely fantastic it's such a fascinating story isn't it I mean it's so you know it's, it's yeah and, and well deserved I have to mm. say and okay. I could only give a brief glimpse into <laughs> all the facets of his work and the, the stories around his his life I mean it's a really really fascinating quite clearly Story and an important piece of the puzzle I have to say absolutely good well we'll keep we'll keep in touch about that lovely um 
Good. Well, I'm sorry that uh, it tends to happen. Yeah. People sign up and they don't come, and I was. Well, so good I think it was a fantastic. Yeah. Actually, it's Thank really you nice so much for spending your evening with me. That was an honor. No, no, it's been a real, a real pleasure. So thank you so much. Thank and you. Very uh, interesting. Those who didn't actually log in tonight, they'll have access to the recording, and indeed, we'll spread the word that the recording is going to be available. Well, thank you I'll, so much. I'll send you the link as well, so you can also. Uh, All right. Bye, it. Bye, everybody. Many thanks. Thanks, everyone. Thank you very much. Keep in touch. Yes. All the best. Yes. Okay. Bye. 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 Bye.